lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I'm Michael, and I'm here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? How you want to start things off today? I don't know. Where you want to start? I don't know. There's usually some chit-chat at the beginning. I I figured you might have something to say. Oh, man. I got so much to say. (laughs) (laughs) Without jeopardizing your job. Oh, then I'm good. (laughs) (laughs) I I, I do have a Corvette back, so I'm excited about that. And I drove it here. Yeah. It cranked up and everything. It made it here. Let's see if you can get it out of the driveway later. If if it cranks up, I'll take it home. (laughs) (laughs) If not, you may be the new proud owner of a Corvette. (laughs) No, no. I don't even want it. You can give it to me. I don't want it. (laughs) Oh, come on. (laughs) It's fun to drive. Oh, it's a blast when it's running, man. Yeah. 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 There's that caveat, though. There, There is a caveat. Yeah. So no, I think I'll skip. I, I got to spend enough money to keep my own car running. So fair enough. You know, yeah. my my own car with two hundred ninety thousand miles on it or whatever. Hey, my vet's got less than a hundred thousand, man. Mm, yeah, it's only like thirty well, something years old. And yet somehow <laughs> my uh, my two hundred ninety thousand mile car is more reliable. Maybe, but it's not as much fun to drive. Oh, don't be so sure about that. <laughs> I'm sure it's a blast. But drive I, the ultimate driving machine. A Corvette? You have a Corvette? <laughs> <laughs> no, the ultimate driving machine. Oh. They advertise that way for a reason, I'm convinced. Uh, your car is fun, too. I've drove your car. Yeah. So, it's good. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I'll have another one someday yeah. that probably doesn't have 290,000 miles on it. <laughs> but, like, the first one... I had I got three hundred and thirty thousand miles out of. Wow! Like it died at three hundred and thirty thousand miles. That's a lot, man. Yeah, that so, was like an eighties model too, wasn't it? Yeah, it was eighty six. No, oh, I thought I knew it was eighties model. God, it was yeah. a beautiful car. It was, and that's like so. I was young when I rode around with you in that car. Yeah, you were young too. Yeah, and um, <laughs> I was always impressed with that vehicle because of the way it was a standard, but mm-hmm. and it may have been just the way you drive it, but mm-hmm. it's it's just sh- seemed to shift so smooth. Like like when you were driving it. I'm a professional. A- apparently, because <laughs> I and I don't know to attribute that to the car or to you, but it's a little like, bit of both. Like it we worked was, together. I was always it was a team effort. I was always impressed riding in that car with you, how smooth it rode yeah. and, and and shifted. I was uh, gonna teach my brother how to drive a standard on the car uh, on that car. Yeah. And um, so I, you know, we took it into this giant parking lot and I put it in neutral and and put the brake on and we switched sides and he got in and he turned the key and it was like Ryan. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was like, man, the car's on. He's like, but it's so sw- quiet and smooth. Yeah. It's <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. Oh, it is. It definitely was. And then um eventually it died. It's always sad, man. And uh my mechanic said um I was lucky that it didn't catch fire. Oh really? Yeah. <laughs> And uh, I said, can we still do that? <laughs> <laughs> Is that still an option? <laughs> <laughs> because the insurance will pay for it if it burns. If it burns, right? <laughs> <laughs> but they won't pay for a new engine and a new transmission. So, oh. Yeah. Oh, well. That's the reason you keep a fire extinguisher in the car. You should. No, no. I would have wanted it to burn. Well, <laughs> Are you not understanding this? <laughs> to collect the insurance money. I'm just saying for people out there listening, if you drive an older car, you should put a fire extinguisher in there because mm-hmm. they catch on fire. Like It can happen. <laughs> this this definitely is a thing. It can happen. But if it does, you probably just want to let it burn. I don't know, man. It's kind of hard to watch your project burn on the side of the road. I'm sure that it is, <laughs> but it's a lot harder to uh, realize that you've got Six thousand dollars in repairs to do, and um, no coverage for any of that. That's true. I Six thousand dollars in repairs <laughs> for a car that's only worth you know fifteen hundred dollars. Yeah, because m- most of these cars aren't. At least these older cars like that, like mine, mm-hmm. that car ain't worth nothing. Yeah, but. I sold the body of that vehicle for five hundred bucks. Scrap. Oh no, I think that they probably were gonna like rebuild. The, oh, were they? Yeah. Oh wow. I don't know. I mean, the it was pristine on the outside. Yeah. yeah well. Maybe. It may still be out there. It was still a beautiful car. It just didn't run. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) Um, Okay, that was a little longer chit-chat than expected, but... Oh, well. (laughs) Got me on a, you know, hiking down memory lane or whatever. Yeah. Uh, So what we want to talk about tonight, Mike? Well, um, I'm not sure where to start. I think that we're going to talk about public versus private. Okay. Um, Just... Uh, and I figured a jumping off point is the recent 
fairly recent. It was a couple of weeks ago now. Yeah. Um, like the fifth, maybe third, somewhere in there, early August anyway, yeah. a couple of weeks ago, um, where there was a bunch of news about uh, uh, President Trump um, firing the uh, CEO and one of the board members of the Tennessee Valley Authority. Yeah. And there was, you know, there was a little bit of a stink about it. I, I didn't hear a whole lot about what the news was saying, but... I heard a little bit about it. The big um, the big headline that they hit on NPR talking about it was that um, apparently this guy was making, like, I want to say they said like $7 million a year or something like that. Like, it was an insane amount of money to be in the public sector. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, like, his assistant was making, like, a mill, I think. is That's what they were saying. I was like, that's kind of crazy. Yeah, and uh, officially those um, those top positions in the uh, Tennessee Valley Authority are supposed to be making, like, $60,000 a year. I mean, that seems about right for a public, you know. I I think that that's a little low, actually. But Maybe. I mean, I mean they should be making six figures, yeah. I think. Yeah. Because it is... Okay, so a little background. All right. Yeah. Um, the Tennessee Valley Authority is a, a New Deal establishment. Okay. Um, there was concern about the uh, growing control of um, utility uh, partnerships, essentially. Um, and so they, uh, th- well, actually, there were a couple of different things that they wanted to do with this. But in 1933, um, the federal government established uh, through legislation the Tennessee Valley Authority um, for flood control, um, electric uh, production, fertilizer production, um, and uh, economic development. It's good news? No, it's not good news. Oh. I mean, they're going to dispatch somebody, but it's going to be like a day. Okay. Not happy. Yeah. <laughs> I'll have to deal with that after we're done. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Liberty Larry's been fretting about this thing at his... His job that pays him. Yeah, yeah, right. The, the place that makes money has issues right now. Yeah, and I, I saw him staring at a text, and I just thought I, I would check. Yeah. Now I wish I hadn't. It's all good. <laughs> um. So uh, anyway, yeah, it was uh, established for uh, flood control, um, fertilizer production, uh, energy generation, and economic development in the Tennessee Valley. It like covers. Um, a lot of Tennessee and parts of Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, Virginia, Kentucky, I, it, like all yeah. across the this um, northern part of the southeast, I, I guess gotcha. you would say, right? Yeah. Um, and it, like, so people go on about this thing because it operates as a private corporation, even though it's federally owned. Really? All right. And the the board is uh, selected by the president and then approved by Senate, just like uh, an ambassador position or something like that. All right. Yeah. Um, and the, the reason that people talk about, you know, how great it is and how it's an example of how wonderful government control of corporation can be um, is because it doesn't use tax money. Uh, it oh, is self-sustaining. So nice. Right? Well, that's cool. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> there's a <laughs> there's, there's always a, a caveat. There's a part of that that they don't tell you, right? Yeah. Uh, so it, it it is self-financing now, but it wasn't made self-financing until 1959. Remember, okay. established in 1933, made self-financing in 1959. So they had 26 so it years. Took them a while to get there. Well, they had 26 years of. Uh, this is a utility company, so they're they're building dams and hydroelectric plants and. Um, coal fire plants and all this stuff and yeah. they're using tax money to build all this infrastructure for the first 26 years and to purchase <laughs> existing utility companies from private owners so basically they got like a head start or whatever absolutely they yeah. didn't have to take on the risk that yeah. a normal private corporation would in trying to establish a business like this yeah absolutely um, and uh, so they got to use taxpayer money to to set themselves up with all the infrastructure they needed to yeah. then become a profitable company. I got gotcha. you. And then they were turned over to self-finance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. I, I mean, it's not like they haven't done stuff since then, obviously, yeah. but... Um, but they, and, they basically got a head start on the government dime. Yeah, uh, on the taxpayer dime. Yeah, taxpayer dime. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. On the R dime. <laughs> right. Um, and in the, in the course of that, by the way, that those early years, um, there was also uh, not only the legislation to... 
established the Tennessee Valley Authority in the first place, but they also um, passed regulations to prevent competition with the Tennessee Valley Authority from private corporations. Yeah. Um, they, like I said, they um, they purchased a bunch of uh, private um, infrastructure uh, pieces of existing utility companies, and they forced uh, some private utility companies shut down because they were unable to compete um, with the with the government. Yeah. And this is one of those things. So, uh, so my father was federal law enforcement and whenever they were setting up, you know, dummy companies and things like that so that they could do surveillance or whatever it happened to be. Yeah. Um, there was a rule that they couldn't, uh, set up a company that was in direct competition with anything that existed in the area. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can't have your dummy company putting other real companies out of business, right? Yeah. And the main reason is because the government companies, they don't have to worry about whether they profit or not. Yeah, right. <laughs> because if they lose money, then they socialize it, right? Yeah, like then yeah. we all pay for the losses and then they keep the profits. They, they that's float how, it along. Yeah, that's how, exactly. That's how it goes. Yeah. Um, and and that's how it went with this company too. I mean, yeah. uh, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, I didn't have enough time to research how they're spending their profits now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but by paying their CEO seven million dollars a year. Well, that seems to be the case, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, so yeah, privatize the profits and socialize the losses. That's yeah. <laughs> that's how, how government business works. Yeah. Um the uh and so the other part of that is they're like, well, it operates like a normal private corporation now, you know, so they have to be profitable and so forth. But yeah. it does I think it's revealing um that in in the more recent history with uh, deregulation of utilities um, or the threat of deregulation, there actually hadn't been <laughs> that much deregulation, but there's been some. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, with the uh, deregulation of utilities and um, the, uh, the looming possibility of competition um, that they responded, like the Tennessee Valley Authority responded um, by cutting their costs by nearly a billion dollars a year. Yeah. All right. Wow. Um, and they fired more than half of their staff and upgraded their facilities to produce, uh, you know, more electrical output. Yeah. All right. And so what, what you should take from that is that they didn't do those things until they were concerned that private corporations might compete directly with them. Yeah. And so up until that time, they were running fat. Yeah. Um, they were running on old technology, um, and they were wasting roughly a billion dollars a year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> that they were able to cut out of their budget when yeah. they were concerned that they might need to. Yeah. Um, oh, absolutely. Might need to deal with a you know somebody else who could provide probably power for less. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Right. Because uh, yeah. And uh, so it just it just goes to show that like all right so this may have been helpful at the beginning this was. And it's hard to say. I, I mean, yeah. like I read a fair bit about this. I, I didn't see anything that that really convinced me that it was necessary. Um, that the the you know that the private utility companies were so taking advantage of people that the government needed to step in. Yeah. yeah. Um, now they did initially provide uh, electricity at a lower rate. No. Um, but it was, it, like I said, at the beginning it was government subsidized, yeah. so they didn't have to turn a profit no. then. So they, and they drove private companies out of business. And the truth is that if, um, they had been constrained by the market, like any other private business, the, yeah. the other private utility companies could have adjusted done things like cutting staff or cutting costs or and competed and competed. Yeah. So chances are, while I, I couldn't, well, I didn't, um, find, uh, anything to verify this. Chances are that they, uh, that the government subsidies allowed them to, um, sell electricity under cost, yeah. um, to people. And that's how they were able to drive out the other competition that they didn't just legislate out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? Um, so, uh, you know, this sounds nice from a consumer point of view. Yeah. Um, until you start to think about the fact that, well, who's paying for the losses? Yeah. Well, the consumer is. And, <laughs> I mean, it's being spread out over all, con you know, all consumers nationwide. 
but we're still all paying for this. It, yeah. You didn't actually save any money. <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> Just um, kind of lay, added a layer of bureaucracy to yeah. it. Yeah. Well, what you did was you ended up in a position where you didn't get to choose how you spent that money, That's right? That's true, too. Um, the, uh, in, instead of um, in a... It's hard to do utilities as a real competitive um, enterprise because there's uh, geographical and logistical constraints of doing that, Yeah. right? Uh, so I, I understand the concern about a monopoly... Um, in utilities. Uh, but the answer to monopoly isn't to make a government monopoly. Uh, you know, yeah. the answer to a private monopoly monopoly isn't to make a government monopoly. Yeah. Um, because like I said, they, they proved that they were not running it like a private company would to try and maximize profits, keep costs down, et cetera. Yeah. Um, it, it may have started off that way, a lot of things actually do, yeah. but over time, government bloats and bloats and bloats yeah. um, because they aren't constrained in any way by the market. Yeah. They also have the authority to turn your power off just for having too many people in your home. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you don't follow the law, we'll turn your power off. <laughs> mm -hmm. And as we talked about last week, and yeah. that's, a, that's another good point. Yeah. Um, and there's no real recourse to it no, where there you, certainly is with a private yeah, company. Yeah, with a private company, you can do something, but with the, with the government, you're going to go complain to the government. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so here's uh, another important point that they often leave out when they talk about when the, you know, the socialist minded, um, talk about the success of the Tennessee Valley authority, yeah. um, is that in the legislation that created them, they were also given the power of eminent domain. Oh, all right. Yeah. You want to tell everybody what eminent domain is, Gary? <laughs> That's where the government comes and takes your property, regardless of whether you want to sell it or not. They yep. make they make you an offer you can't refuse. <laughs> right. So this is the true. <laughs> this is another one of those things that I, I think about. Um, what Dave Smith always says about the government yeah. of uh, that the the government is the mafia masquerading as a human rights organization. <laughs> it's so true, man. And this is, this this is, is a prime is, example of that. Absolutely, just like the mafia, right? Like yeah. they come in, they make you an offer. If you don't accept that offer, too bad. <laughs> yeah, you, you, that's what you get. You you can fight it for a while and spend more of your money fighting it, but mm -hmm. in the end of the day, they're going to get what they want at the price they want. Yep, exactly. Um, and so they. They use this power uh, oh. plenty, and I did come across a bunch of reports, particularly from the late seventies when they were trying to, uh, when they were building up nuclear facilities. Yeah. Um, but they were also adding. Um, oh dang, uh, I can't remember the name. There was a specific uh, dam uh, project that they built um, for hydroelectric power that they uh, that created a lot of um, pushback yeah. from people. And they used eminent domain to get the land Take that they the land. wanted. Yeah. Um, and so, <laughs> like, what I like to... Okay, so here's another way of, of talking about eminent domain. It's uh, the government coercively purchasing property. Yeah. <laughs> right? So they, they say, this is the property that we want, and we're going to offer you a fair price. Yeah. And you say, I don't think that's a fair price. Yeah. And they say... Yeah, but that's the price you're going to get, and you don't really have a choice. It's it's yeah. a coercive purchase of, of property. Yeah. Um, and uh, but then so there are these reports from the from the late seventies, particularly. I came across several of them um, where the Tennessee Valley Authority uh, coercively purchased some property from some people, like, uh, and they were you know generations old yeah. uh, properties in the families. family property. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, several hundred acres of farmland or whatever it happened to be, yeah. uh, so that they could flood the area. Oh, okay. Just, um, to make a pop culture reference, it's not, I don't know how pop culture it is anymore, but, yeah. uh, the movie, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? You remember this film? Vague. Um, it's Coen Brothers film. It's a great film. It's funny. Yeah. Um, anyway, like the, the thing that they were racing, the time constraint in that movie, <laughs> um, was he was trying to get back to his family home to try and find the wedding ring that he'd given his wife. Um, but he was trying to get back there before the Tennessee Valley authority flooded the land. Oh, really? like that's, that, <laughs> that was, was the... the thing, the driving <laughs> factor in the, in the movie. Yeah. Um, and so anyway, in these, uh, cases that I came across, they, they coercively purchased these, you know, hundreds of acres of property from these people, pushing them off their land. And, you know, they, they've probably over 
their history, some figures I found uh, estimated that they pushed roughly 15,000 people off their property. Wow. Um, That's a lot of people. And, you know, I mean, it's 80 whatever years of yeah. their existence, but. Yeah. But still, that's still. yeah, fifteen thousand people pushed off their property, yeah. um, and uh, then they they didn't use all of the property that they purchased, yeah. and then they gave that property to <laughs> local developers. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. So they purchased these family properties from these private owners, yeah. um, you know, two hundred acres, let's say. Yeah. Uh, they end up only using for what for their purposes a couple of acres of it, and then they give one hundred and eighty something acres to a local developer to speculate with, um, <laughs> to build now lakefront property. Yeah, right. Because yeah, now that's that's expensive <laughs> you know, property. Yeah, now. exactly. Yeah. At twice the value of what they um, yeah. what they had purchased it for. Wow. You know? Yeah, oh, and so think about that in another way, too. You talk about um, converting uh, public funds to private funds. They yeah. use taxpayer money. Now, not in this case, obviously, because this was after the fact. But this think was, about it in, in yeah. terms of government doing this kind of thing. Yeah. Um, you use taxpayer uh, money to purchase property, purchase private property, against yeah. the, the wishes of the property of the owner. owner, yeah. Um, then uh, you don't use it all. And you, instead of selling it back to the, the people, people who had it originally, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, or or giving it, if you're going to give it away, maybe back to the person that you took it from. That would be um, nice. Yeah. <laughs> you give it to local private developer. Yeah. That then it develops it and sells it at a premium. For a huge property. Yeah. yeah. Insane, man. Yeah. That's this government at its best, man. Yeah. So even if they're not using taxpayer money to do this, just think about how terrible that is it's anyway. Still, yeah. Like it's... even if they're using their own profits to purchase this property, then they're giving it away to somebody that isn't the property owner after coercively <laughs> taking it from the property owner and then allowing them to profit tremendously it's off. Terrible, it. man. Yeah. Terrible. So that's that's the Tennessee Valley Authority. Yeah. So um you know, being upset with Trump about uh, about controlling the board of this company. Well, that's actually his privilege. It's it's, it's yeah. federally owned. Yeah. Um, the president gets to choose these people and, and yeah. so forth. He, get, he gets a say. <laughs> yeah. So that shouldn't be the problem that people are talking about. Yeah. The problem that people should be talking about is the existence of a federally owned corporation. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, that's fascism by definition, if absolutely. I'm not correct, if yeah. I'm not wrong, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, actually, it's in this case, since it's not privately owned, yeah. it wouldn't be fascism. Okay. It, it is real socialism. So it's socialism. Okay. Yeah, it, it is. Uh, I always get my fascism and socialism. It's it's confused. essentially government owning the means of production. Okay. Right, it's a right. government-owned corporation. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. So, um, anyway, yeah, this it's the worst kind. And it, they've done good things. I mean, they certainly did uh, kind of modernize the, this part of the country, which was part yeah. of their purpose. Yeah. Um, and they they modernized farming practices in a lot of ways. They, you know, they, they did have a positive economic impact at the beginning. Yeah. Um, did it have to be government controlled? No. Exactly. No. And over time, think about how much money has been taken out of the economy for for private uh, ownership yeah. in various ways by the existence of this corporation. Yeah. Especially at the beginning when they were using taxpayer money to do all this. Stuff. <laughs> yeah, when it was being floated by us. Yeah. <laughs> um, so then, uh, all right, so I, th I thought I would move from that to uh, there has been you know, talking about these compensation issues with the, um, the CEO and, uh, this other board member that, that Trump fired. Um, and this is another thing that Trump got heat for is he was, uh, freezing, um, wages for government employees. I don't know if you remember this, this is years ago now, like the right yeah. at the beginning of his presidency, he's like, yeah, no raises for government employees were I do remember that because the there was a bunch of um protest and unions were out on the streets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was that was at the beginning. I remember that. Yeah. Um so then of course the, what they were complaining about the whole time is that the uh that the um government employees are already overworked and underpaid and so on and so forth and yeah. so on and so forth. Um but the the facts don't really support that position. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so um, 
the uh, Congressional Budget Office has done a couple of reports on this over the years, um, comparing private and and public um, compensation packages. Yeah. All right. And uh, so the most recent one was, um, I guess it was for the 2016 year, but it was released in 2017. And it showed that um, particularly, and they did try to adjust for, you know, um, normal factors that affect compensation, um, experience, education, the kind of occupation, et cetera. Um, and they were trying to figure out how much they could, uh, they could save the federal government by employing a, uh, uh, a plan that would pay public sector workers approximately what private sector workers of the same type were getting paid. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that right there belies the idea that they are underpaid because yeah. they're talking about saving money by paying them the same <laughs> as, as a as, private sector as, worker. Yeah. Okay. The private sector. Yeah. Um, and this was a, a repeat of a study that they'd done five years earlier in 2011, 2012. Yeah. Um, and the result was that the compensation gap had widened, that public sector workers were getting paid even more than their private sector counterparts, mm-hmm. um, you know, five years later. Yeah. And uh, so it, it did break down a little bit um, by uh, level of education. Uh, so um, the uh, uh, bachelor's degree, like people who had a college degree, yeah. uh, essentially... Um, only earned like five to ten percent more than uh, private sector counterparts, um, but and uh, the people with the uh, advanced degrees like doctorates, etc., yeah. um, they earned less, uh, almost a quarter less than their private sector counterparts. Yeah. Um, the big one was people that had uh, a high school education or less, yeah. and they earned um, more than a third more than their private sector counterparts. Really? So. Uh, as an example, let's say that you are a uh, guy who didn't finish high school um, and you're working as a janitor or something like that um, at yeah. uh, for, uh, you know, probably just for like, you know, any public building or any, whatever. But yeah, yeah you're, a, you're a federal employee employed as a janitor to clean, you know, Langley. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. um, so you, if, as a private sector employee, if you were to make $24,000 a year, you would make $32,000 a year as a public sector employee doing that same thing. Need to get that public job, man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, and, that, and that's the thing. Like, it used to be, um, you used to be able to earn more in the private sector than the public sector. Yeah. And that's shifted over time. Yeah. And I think it's really clear from how much our government spends. Also, yeah. there's a whole lot more public sector employees than there used to be, too. Yeah. Um, well, the government's constantly growing. I mean... Yeah. It, and this is... It, and the government always constantly grows. It doesn't generally... Government doesn't generally get smaller over time. <laughs> and it's the same for any kind of, like, public sector stuff like they just they always there's always going to be more and more and more you mm-hmm. know because yeah. you never you don't ever shut down federal buildings you just build more <laughs> yeah yeah and they don't they don't fire people yeah oh yeah well and that's the other thing like yeah once you get a good government job it's hard to get rid of that good government job yeah. which is the reason like when you go to the dmv or somewhere it's a freaking disaster those people don't care because they don't have to care mm-hmm. like in the private sector then people be caring because they need that job and they know that if they don't treat you right, they're going to lose that job. Yeah. But in the public sector, they don't care. They're not getting fired. Yeah. You kidding me? (laughs) Well, in, in this particular um, study, they concluded that they, uh, that they could save approximately six and a half billion dollars by paying the low skilled workers, uh, roughly what they would get paid in the private sector for the same job. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, well, that's like one and a half percent of our current federal budget, something like that. Yeah. Less so than 2%. It's not, it's not a lot of money in the grand scheme of things, but, but it is but it's it's six just, and a half billion dollars of taxpayer money. That's well, six and a half billion dollars that could be put back into the economy. Oh, absolutely. To actually to generate jobs that would pay more. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and um, that would come in the form of lowering taxes. Yeah, but that, I mean, you know, that's not going to happen. Like, we, well, that's the reason I say it is because, like, yeah, we're not doing yeah. that. Like, no, no, no. no, I mean, but it, it the idea is that it's you know it's six and a half billion dollars that's being spent by your federal government that could be spent by private enterprise more effectively. 
I guess the argument for the other side would be, though, that that money's still going into people's hands who are putting it into the economy. Mm -hmm. But it, it's generating problems for, uh, for managers like yourself. We were oh. talking at the very beginning of the last episode about how you were having trouble getting people to work for you because oh, they yeah. can make more staying home. Yep. Well, you know, they can also make more working for the federal government or state government or whatever you know, the case yeah. might be. Yeah. They can make more working for the government. What they, what they've done here is that they have, um, artificially raised, the going rates for no skill or low skill low jobs. Skill. And it's true. Um, there's definitely, there, there's a shortage of low skill employees right now mm -hmm. because they don't need to work. I mean, well, yeah, I mean, that's the case now, but even when they do need to work, they're better off working for the government. Yeah. And, um, the, uh, like I said, government employment has, has grown quite a bit. All right, that was a good text. Man, I just got some good news. Oh, man, like so much weight just got lifted off my shoulders. You just don't know, man. Did, did, they, did they make it so that you can hire people again? Uh, not that much weight. Oh, okay. <laughs> but the tech arrived. Um, so there's been a, a several other studies that looked at the same kind of thing. Um, yeah. Now, one of the ones that you see out there a lot, especially from the big government people, yeah. um, is the uh, the – there was a, a similar study from Obama's pay agent yeah. and it found that federal employees earned almost a quarter less than, uh, than their counterparts in the private sector. Really? All right. Here's the problem. Though. Yeah. Like look into this a little, just a little just, bit. Just right? scratch the surface <laughs> okay. here a little bit. Um, it does not account for, uh, for benefits first off. Yeah. Um, and that, that is one of the big selling points of government jobs is they usually have a pretty good benefits package, especially oh, yeah. low skilled. You're like, you're getting medical, you're getting all these things that often aren't offered with low skilled jobs in the private sector. Yeah. Retirement and stuff too. Right? Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Nice retirement. Um, and it, it can account to up for up to 80% of the difference, um, in the value of uh, a private sector versus a public sector job. Yeah. Um, so they didn't account for benefits. They didn't account for education. They didn't account for experience, and they didn't account for skills. Oh, wow. So it's <laughs> uh, a lot of holes in this. <laughs> yeah, it's starting to look like the gender wage gap. <laughs> yeah, stuff, right. right? Yeah, um, yeah. So, yeah, well, we just uh, took an average of all and then compared it to the average of all. We didn't compare <laughs> apples to apples. Yeah. Um, and that's essentially what it is, which makes it a pretty much useless study. Yeah, yeah. Um, there were uh, several others, mostly done by college or like university um, research. And uh, they showed um, federal employees got roughly between uh, 15 and 60 percent more on average. Right. Um, now, and the differences in those is mostly like uh, how they valued um, benefits, like what, you know, how much value they placed on specific benefits. That's a that's a big part of the difference there. Yeah. Um, and uh, and, you know, whether they. Uh, included or, you know, adjusted for the extra um, vacation days that federal employees get or government employees get as compared to private sector um, employees, okay. um, whether they included as a benefit the job security of a government job as opposed to a private sector job, yeah, et cetera. But that, that security is like one of those things that, um, that creates a problem yeah. that is why government uh, you know, government functions generally less efficiently than, than the private sector yep. is that it, it's hard to fire people. Um, the, the government is all in order to keep it fair. Yeah. Uh, you have generally like set wage increases and promotions that happened at certain times, regardless of how good you are at your job. Yeah. That's another real problem because in most industries, like particularly mine, I mean, the harder mm -hmm. you work, the more you're going to make. I mm -hmm. mean, that's just the way it is. And you, there's plenty of room to move up, but you've got to put in the work to do it. Yeah. Not the case with government. Like you show yeah. up, you don't get fired. Yeah. It's hard to get fired anyway. <laughs> yeah. It's all based on seniority. <laughs> yeah. How long exactly. have you been here? Okay. You get promoted. Yeah. Um, oh, and and that's the worst system, man. Like a seniority system, like just thinking about it makes me angry. Like it's just, it's, yeah. it's a horrible way to grade people. <laughs> like, yeah. Well, and they, um, you know, there were some other studies that like, this is kind of survey type studying. So it, it you know, yeah. take what you will out of it. But, um, but even government, uh, employees, um, less than a third of them thought that 
there they had effective means of um of rewarding good employees and uh punishing bad employees yeah or re- reducing the compensation like motivating yeah. we'll say yeah. motivating we'll say moti- yeah that's, that sounds good <laughs> motivating bad employees to yeah. do better um, so they had very limited ways of, of, uh, providing, you know, carrots and sticks. Yeah. Yeah. And just like I talked about a minute ago, like the same thing, like, I mean, there's no reason to do a good job. Like what's the, doesn't matter one way or the other. Right. Like the guy, you're going to D- get your regular promotion <laughs> yeah. and your regular pay raise. Exactly. And the guy at the DMV mm-hmm. doesn't care if you complain about him. His boss isn't going to do anything. See, just like you said, he doesn't have a way to punish him. Like, yeah. I mean, maybe he'll get, if he does something like serious enough, he'll mm-hmm. get something on his, a mark on his record or something. But like how many of those is it going to take to get rid of him? Like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And how serious does it have to be? There's, there's no, there's no reward for good service. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and that brings us, and a a lot of this is, so the, the union positions have shifted over time too. So, um, it used to be back in the heyday of the, of the labor unions, uh, that roughly a third of private sector employees were union and, and probably around 10% were, um, of government employees were union. Well, now it's yeah. like the other way around. So uh, only about 10% of private sector employees are unionized and um, about a third. Actually, I think it's pushing close to 40% now of public sector employees are unionized. And I don't know this, but I'm just going to take a stab in the dark and guess here that the reason that there's so fewer private sector unions is because a lot of those companies went under. Yeah. Because the union... Pulled them under, <laughs> yeah. Because I know that I, I know that happens. I know mm-hmm. that the union just pulls so much from the company to a point where mm-hmm. the company just can't make it anymore. Yeah, look at the auto industry in this country. Well, that's if and that it, was going to be my example was the yeah. auto industry. I mean, the auto industry. I mean, the unions almost bankrupted. The, well, they, well did. they did. Well, they did. The government <laughs> just came in and bailed them out. Right. I forget how soon I forget. <laughs> yeah. That. Um, that's exactly what happened, though, is mm-hmm. those unions, when times were good, the unions bled the company down, mm-hmm. and then when the rough times hit, they weren't able to float it because they they had already been bled so dry. Yeah. I mean, and, that, yeah. and that's what happened there. Well, and, and that is a huge part of it. it I mean, uh, a lot of the reason that the um, the existence or the, the numbers of people uh, in private sector unions has gone down is because now that you have kind of a globalized or mostly globalized economy, um, that if you try and push those wages up too much, then you lose out to foreign competition. Absolutely. Um, and so there, it's been a kind of a weird balancing act, um, where they, they want to push the wages up. And to me, like, I don't understand why. Okay. So, if you want to unionize, unionize. Like I, I don't well, have a problem with the existence of private unions. Me either. Um, I, I don't know why you would want to be a part of it because it seems to me, and you know, somebody who knows, who's been on the inside, knows more about this can correct me. Michael at the Liberty Mike. Um, I'm happy to hear your story, but it seems to me that one of the really kind of terrible things that unions do is that they protect the worst employees. Okay. So that's exactly what I was going to say. And I was going to go into a little bit is because I've, so we, we had some threats at one point that the company I work for could end up unionized. And that was my concern. And I, and I told my people when we were going through some of these processes, I was like, y'all do whatever y'all want to, but just know me as your supervisor, I'm not going to be able to help you once you go union. You, you like the union will completely cut me out of this and you will have to deal with the union where, and it's, it's not. So as an individual, if you're a good hard worker and you want to move up, that's a lot harder to do in a union type situation Mm -hmm. because the union's not concerned with you. The union's concerned with protecting everybody. And so now you're part of Mm -hmm. everybody. You're not just you. You don't represent yourself anymore. Mm -hmm. The union represents you. Um, so if you have a pro, if you're if you're my employee and you have a problem, you don't come to me anymore. Mm-hmm. You go to the union. Yeah. Do you think the union's going to work with you better than I will? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and my people, have, I've got a, my people have a lot of respect. There's a re- respect both ways. They know mm-hmm. they can come to me with any situation and we'll take care of it. Mm-hmm. Um, now I get not every manager is that way. That there's exceptions to all of this, but. Yeah. 
but yeah, you as as a worker, you don't want to be in a union. You mm-hmm. you're you're taken away from your representation and giving it to, you yeah, know. yeah. It, to me, it, it represents the worst aspects of socialism. It's totally anathema to what I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, in you know that that everybody's an individual and that you you make it or not. Yeah. Based on your own decisions. Yeah. Like you're responsible for your own life. Yeah. And um, the the union kind of makes everybody uh, all fit in the same box. And so um, the people that are really good have limited opportunities to advance um, in any kind of exceptional way yeah. like they might in a private sector, like, you know, without oh, yeah. the union being involved. Absolutely. And the weakest employees stick around longer than they should because it makes it very difficult to deal with bad employees. Yeah, exactly. And it's 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 a bad system. And they it's something else that they just, it mucks up the gears of being able to run an efficient business. Mm-hmm. The the union does. Yeah. Um, just, and there's, there's a lot of reasons for that, but mm-hmm. that maybe I don't need to go into. Right yeah. Now. But there's, it, it mucks up the gears of being able to run efficiently like you end up having to do a bunch of things that you wouldn't normally do Mm -hmm. um to to make things less efficient yeah well okay and so that's you know that's private sector unions then you move to public sector unions which i do have a problem with which i really think shouldn't exist and so so that go go back to the point that we made a minute ago that the Mm -hmm. unions brought down all of these other or have in the past at least Mm -hmm. we know of at least a few examples where the where the union has brought down some of these companies unfortunately when it comes to private when it turns to government sector unions there's no bringing down the government. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, unions are not going to be the thing to to kill this beast for us. Like yeah. it's it's not going to be the unions that bring the government down. <laughs> so, um <laughs> recently, uh the uh, the biggest police union in New York City endorsed uh Donald Trump. Yeah. All right. Um so that shouldn't made be a lot surprising of too, but yeah, uh, you know, but New York yeah. City is very Anyway, um, <laughs> still though, I mean, Trump's a big supporter of law enforcement. Like yeah. nobody should be surprised by that. Yeah, um, yeah, it, it shouldn't be surprising. Now, here's the surprising bit. Yeah, God help us. I'm about to read a tweet from Alexandria Ocasio Cortez that I agree with. Oh, here we go. <laughs> yep. Um, so afterwards. Uh, AOC tweeted, um, also, does anyone else see a potential problem with police unions, enforcement arms of the state with lethal weapons, promoting preferred candidates for office, or is that just me? And I have to say, you know what? It's not just you. Now, her reasons are a little different than mine. (laughs) (laughs) All right. I'm pretty sure. And I also, you know, without getting into the political aspect, I mean, I think it, it goes without say that if the police union had endorsed Joe Biden... It'd be a different story. Yeah, we wouldn't have gotten any kind of critical comment out of her. Yeah. Um, but this is like this is something that we have said on this very podcast before. Like, yeah. do you want the the people that have the uh, power of coercion to be able to negotiate with a bunch of legislators on your behalf? Yeah. Without your say. Exactly. Right. So, because that's that's what happens. Yes, I am. I am in agreement with you, uh, AOC. Um, there is a real problem with public sector unions. Now, I don't end it at police unions. Yeah. Um, I, I include uh, teachers' unions and any other public sector union. They don't have yeah. to be carrying um, lethal weapons to be a problem yeah. um, <laughs> for the people. Yeah. Uh, in their uh, negotiations for you know, better conditions, better pay, et cetera, et cetera. Because here's yeah. what happens actually. So let's just say it's a teacher's union. Yeah. So the teacher's union, um, you know, they threaten to strike or whatever. Uh, the, if they Not don't threaten. get, they did at the beginning of the Trump administration. Well, that's true. There, were, there were active strikes going on. I just, I know you're just pontificating, yes. but still. <laughs> yeah. Um, so they, they threaten to strike if they don't get better pay. Yeah. Um, and maybe less hours or whatever. Yeah. So they threaten to strike. Well, um, the legislators in a position where they don't want the teachers union to strike because all those kids at home, he's going to get a bunch of angry parent phone calls yeah. and he's going to probably get a bunch of business phone calls too, because people are saying that they, uh, you know, they can't get their employees into work cause their employees have to stay home with the kids because the kids can't go to school because the teachers aren't there. Right. Yep. So you have all this problem. And so the legislators like, all right, fine, give them whatever they want. 
Exactly. All right. So the legislator agrees to give them more money. Yep. But where does that money come from? It comes from us. It comes from the taxpayer. And guess what? And he's not really, the, the legislator, he's not really seeing any negatives from this. He can give them as much money as he wants because it ain't his money either. Right. It's it's our money. <laughs> yeah. And that's exactly it. So the, the issue where the private sector uh, unions can um, negotiate themselves right out of a job. Yeah. Public sector unions really can't. Yeah, because there is no there is no uh, profit and loss um, system to keep them in check in any way. Yeah, uh, they can they can make as much money as they can get the legislators to agree with. Yeah. and if the government doesn't have the money to do it, they just take it from you. Yep. Oh, absolutely, and that's exactly what happens. Either that, or they print it. But <laughs> that's a well, whole other yeah. story. <laughs> but that's another way of taking it from you. It yeah, just takes a little end, longer to. Yeah, to yeah. In the end, it's to still coming it. out your pocket. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, the, you know, that's, that's the issue with public sector unions. Public yeah. sector unions are dangerous because there's nothing to counterbalance them. Well, and there's, and th that's the reason you've hit a point here where there's more public sector unions than there is private mm -hmm. is because the private ones aren't going to go anywhere. Once you have a private sector union, there's no reason for it to disband, but, and the company's not going to go under. So. You mean the public sector union? Yeah, the public sector. Yeah. 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 They're, they're, the, the public's not going under, mm -hmm. <laughs> so there will always be they will always be able to take more of our money. Yeah, yeah, so. absolutely. And it's um, it's a problem with democracy. And I, I've been reading uh, Democracy: The God That Failed. Those. So oh man! Is, so you have been. I was. <laughs> gonna, I meant to ask you when I came out when I got here if you had started it yet. Yeah, I've started it. Um, and so this is probably going to come up more as I get further into this book. Uh, but. Um, actually, this goes back to a uh, uh, Thomas Sowell thing. Um, yeah. You know, Thomas Sowell has always said that the the problem with uh, democracy is that the legislators only have to think as far as the next election. Yeah, um, they can they make decisions based on the he, the here and now. What's going to yeah. get them the most votes for the upcoming election? They don't have to consider what kind of problems it's going to create well, beyond that. And and that it prevents them from making the tough decisions. There's no reason to make mm -hmm. the tough decisions and take the medicine now. Yeah, just kick it down the curb four more years or two more years, whatever the case is, mm -hmm. and and let the or deal with it then, or let the next person deal with it. Yeah, you and know? so um, which you is know. probably part of the reason that things just steadily seem to get worse and worse mm -hmm. because there's no nobody nobody there to take the tough medicine to do it now. Yeah. And that could be something that term limits may would have an impact on. Mm -hmm. I don't think term limits are the end all be all, but I don't think it's bad either. Yeah, I don't think that it would have any impact cuz yeah. you're still thinking short term. Yeah. Like you know, yeah. you only have to keep people happy for as long as you're in office now. Yeah. Um, and actually, you know, Hoppe's thesis is that democracy was a step back from uh, yeah. monarchical types of government. Not that he's promoting monarchy, but yeah. um, he's saying that at least in a monarchical type of government, they're looking long term. Yeah. Um, they're looking uh, to, you know, their entire lives and the lives of their children, yeah. et cetera, to try and keep things afloat. You know, especially economic, because he's looking yeah. at it as an economist, right? Yeah. So he's he's looking at you know the, that a monarchy, um, um, particularly a generational monarchy, uh, is looking at the trying to keep the the nation afloat for as long as possible. They want things to to be solvent throughout their life and the lives of their children and grandchildren, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Whereas in a democracy, it's very short term. They're not yeah. concerned about the long term at all. Yeah. They're only concerned about the here and now. Yeah. Um, Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Not that I would pers directly promote monarchy. Well, and but, he doesn't either. I mean, his... his but, in, but it isn't... Yeah. But there's an argument there. Yeah. I mean, that, that's the perspective that he's looking at it from. Yeah. Um, and of course, the, the, the grand perspective is that you know, individual freedom is what really wins out. Yeah. Um, the, everybody making their own decisions, just the individual human actions to promote their own well being uh, within a framework of a respect for uh, natural rights yeah. is, is the ideal. That's the ideal. Yeah. 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 And that seems like a good place to end, I suppose. Yeah. Um, so, uh, as always. Um, well, we didn't talk about the, 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 Convention. There's a DNC convention going on right now. Oh, I hadn't it's... been paying any attention to it, honestly. <laughs> so if you got things you want to say about it, go ahead. I don't have a whole lot to say other than I did want to mention it is going on and that 
just everybody keep in mind as you're watching, I've watched a good bit of it, not all of it, but I've watched a fair amount of it, that this is like such a blessing for the Democrats. Like the whole idea that it's all virtual, mm -hmm. that there's not an in-person convention is a huge win for them. Yeah. Because, I mean, you don't have to, you can, that it's all like little snippets of different mm -hmm. people talking. There's And they have, and here's what where the real advantage for them, particularly in this cycle is, is they have con total control over the message. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, Unlike, they don't have to worry about Bernie Bros protesting. And, yeah, there's no yeah. none of that going on, and and it's just it's because it, I've been watching it, and it's been like I say they they're getting their message out there, mm -hmm. and they're not having to deal with Joe Biden like slipping up and saying something stupid because they can cut that out or <laughs> yeah. like. Well, he even has trouble reading a script, so we'll. I mean, we'll see. Doesn't we'll he speak see. today? He speaks tonight. Yeah. yeah. So um, we'll see how it all plays out. And I've been watching, waiting for that like big screw up moment it yeah. hadn't really happened yet. I mean there there's some crazy stuff being said mm -hmm. but um and that's from a libertarian perspective but yeah um, um didn't they confirm uh Kamala first though? yeah th that was a yeah that's generally out of order right like I mean uh, so I did find that interesting I mean I I, yeah. I could be wrong about this, but I'm pretty sure the way it usually goes is that they don't confirm the VP candidate. They confirm the presidential candidate. Yeah. The presidential candidate announces who he wants his VP to be, and then they rubber stamp it. Yeah. Like, that's... Normally. That seems to me how it's usually gone. Yeah. And I, I don't know what to make of it, yeah. but I find it interesting that they confirmed the VP candidate before the presidential candidate this year. Yeah, oh, that is true. Because I, and that's what I was watching for the other night. I was like, man, maybe like something crazy is going to happen. They're going to like push Biden out somehow and because pick Hillary. Maybe. <laughs> I mean, I didn't even know if they'd go the Hillary route. But I mean, everybody in the DNC has to know that Biden is a like the only thing that can give Trump a win is Biden. Yeah. Like that's. Well, I'm uh, I am going to have to pay up to a few people. Since obviously Hillary didn't end up getting the nomination, and I, yeah, I well, yeah, really the, si the cycle's gonna, not over, <laughs> man. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> I, I would, I'm, I think you've got up until like election day okay. to to pay those debts, man. I will hold out. I would, I would hold out till then because there's still some some real estate between here and there, man. That's true. That's so, true. And because I'm telling you, like <laughs> Biden's hanging by a thread, man. So you mean his. Uh, his campaign. Like, oh, I, or, I was thinking like his sanity or his... Well, that too. Like, uh, well, I mean, it's only... I, his I'm, consciousness. I'm, is, I'm curious to see if he can ride this thing mm. all the way through without like a major screw up that cost him either yeah. the election or them just blatantly having to change candidates. Well, they have to avoid debates. Yeah. There, there's and this this virus gives them all the fuel and ammunition to do that. Yeah. But and and you say that and that's going to be the excuse. But there's no reason they couldn't do a debate over like what they're doing for the convention. Yeah. A it's Skype or they Zoom could, they debate. Could be, yeah, they could be in two different parts of the country and mm -hmm. still have a debate. So there's no reason that shouldn't still happen. <laughs> yeah, with somebody standing there holding up flashcards for Joe just <laughs> off camera. <Yeah>. Exactly. <laughs> hey, and yeah, they could. Yeah, that may be what they end up doing. Too. Yeah, I mean, that, I think that's what they would have to do. There's, they have to. Yeah. yeah, they'd have to. Um, but like I said, he even has trouble reading a script right now. Yeah, I don't. I, um, I, I tell you, man, it's a mess. It's But I, I I didn't feel like we should close out the podcast without at least, you know, acknowledging that this, this is going on. The Republicans go next week, and I'll be curious to kind of see how it goes for them, mm -hmm. see if it's as controlled as this has been. Yeah. But you can, watching it, you can just tell, like, there's so much control there that they haven't had in past conventions. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's interesting. Yeah. Strange times we live in. Yeah, it is. Well, I mean, it's it's more the uh, the kind of fake government that you that yeah. we that those of us that have been paying attention realize it's been there for a long time. But yeah. now it's even more well, it's, apparent. But it, it's, it's just blatant now. Yeah. Um. That well, it's you know, it's all about this messaging. We got to get up there and say these particular things, and everybody will eat it up, and we'll just move on and keep going about our business as usual, yep. uh, without any real regard for the people that we're supposedly representing. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Did I turn so. that into a downer? I didn't mean to. <laughs> it's uh, all good. Yeah. So, well, uh, you know, I guess it's better. I, I did. Uh, I almost wanted to mention a little something about Belarus 
then as long as we were throwing stuff out there. Oh, but yeah. no, no, no. We'll, we'll pick well, that up at some other time. We can pick it up another time, but just kind of let everybody out there know. Something to keep an eye on. Yeah. See, um, pay it, attention. It just, just, yeah, pay attention that this is very similar to the way, and, and I'm, I'm pretty confident that U.S. intelligence is involved in this coup attempt yeah. um, in uh, Belarus where they're trying to get rid of Lukashenko. Yeah. Um, but I don't have any real evidence of that except to say that it is what's going on here with a uh, disputed election, um, people out in the streets, etc. cetera. Uh, the, it's the slipper revolution now. Like it's always <laughs> got to have some weird always. little call sign, right? Yep. Um, that This is very similar to other similar types of regime change regime changes and regime change attempts that we've seen that we know that US intelligence was involved in like Egypt and Libya and Ukraine and Venezuela this yeah. is just very similar pattern to what we've seen before in Hong Kong yeah. um you know to what we've seen before and just be aware of that yeah something to pay attention to yeah something going on out there um and Lukashenko is not Putin's puppet <laughs> yeah, because that was my big takeaway from the from the news the other day. Yeah, like, no, was... there's been some disagreement. He kind of tries to play both sides. Actually, Lukashenko yeah. does. He's, I mean, he understands that that Russia is powerful on one side, but he's he's a strong man. He's not giving up power to Putin either. Yeah, um, but he doesn't want to upset him too much. Well, yeah, but he's done the same thing with the U.S. Yeah. Um, you know, he just, he's trying to play both sides and yeah. he has for a long time. He's just trying to maintain his own power. Which I was fixing to say is probably the wisest thing for him to do. Yeah. I mean, you, cause you don't really want to piss either side off, mm -hmm. like, cause that's trouble either way. Yeah. So. And you won't see it on the news, but there, are, there are counter protests as well. There are people out there protesting in favor of Lukashenko as well as the people that are protesting against him. Yeah. You definitely won't see that in the news. <laughs> so I haven't seen it in the news. Yeah. It. It's happening, I promise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've seen it. Well, fair I mean, enough. not with my own two eyes, but I... You I've didn't seen, go there, right? I've, yeah, I've seen, the, I've seen the video. There's no yeah. new stamp in my passport, but it's... Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah. Well, now we can wrap it up, right? Yeah, okay. I think so. I feel like I've said everything I feel like saying. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, we're close to an hour here, so... Um, all right, well, uh, follow us on Facebook. Uh, subscribe on iTunes and Podbean. Um I, and or Podbean. I I'll guess. do both. Yeah, it helps. <laughs> um, like and share, comments. Uh, you can email me, Michael at the Liberty Mike. Um, you know, uh, leave a review at iTunes or Podbean. Um, you can also comment on Podbean. I don't think you can really comment on iTunes, but you can comment on Facebook. Yeah. Um, and uh, there is still discussion of setting up a private Facebook group. Yeah, I haven't done any of the legwork on that, but I do want to do that. That's something I think that would be yeah be beneficial. Um, so we'll probably do that uh, at some point, but who knows when? And um, and we're getting into hurricane season for me, so there there might Ooh. be some uh, interesting um, schedule changes as necessary. And we might just be yeah. recording at like three a.m. <laughs> sometimes. It's hard to say. Yeah. Um, Definitely want to keep content, keep getting content out to you. Yeah. Oh, and uh, we're not planning on doing a podcast next week. Um, I got some medical stuff next week, so uh, I don't know where, like, how I'm going to be feeling, essentially. Yeah. Um, so we're not planning on doing a podcast uh, next week, but we'll be back in two weeks when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try and stay free. Life short, live free. Ciao. Later. Mm -hmm.